whatever we do for Veterans Day, it's got to be big. We've got three whole days. Hey, right, how about we go bowling? Bowling? Come on, Gerald. How about golf? Golf? Oh, no, we don't golf. That's something you do when you're an old man, not when you turn 30. The question is, what are we going to do this weekend? Don't worry. We'll think of something. I'll call you later. Golf? Well, now that we're all here, seeing as how it's Veterans Day weekend, I think this is the perfect time to finally tell you all the story of how I single-handedly won the most important battle in World War II. There I was on the battlefields of Northern Europe. Uh, you know, Gramps, I just remembered uh, I, I left my underwear in the dryer. Yeah, I also left my underwear in Ernie's dryer. Hey, wait a minute. Where are you all going? I'm late for my sewing circle. Hey, come back here, you. I'm not finished. I... Oh... I'll never get to tell my story. Oh, well, I'll have my dessert. Hey! Somebody ate my pudding! Oscar! I guess you and Arnold had the same idea as Gerald and me. Well, Oscar stole my pudding, and I wanted dessert, so here we are. I thought it would be nice for just Gerald and me to go out. I get so busy with work and everything else, I don't get to spend enough time with Gerald. And they grow up so fast. You probably feel the same way about Arnold. No, actually, I spend plenty of time with Arnold. Oh, that kid's always around. Everywhere I look, there he is. I can't get rid of him. And sometimes I think he'll never grow up. You know how much I could get for his room? Look, I love the aquarium just as much as the next kid. But I'm not going to spend my whole weekend looking at fish. Kill the clock, 3 o'clock. I see him. All I wanted to do was tell my World War II story. But before I could get a word out, they're all getting up and running from the table. I'm telling you, nobody respects Veterans Day anymore. I know what you mean. I served in Vietnam, but nobody wants to hear about it. They hold that big Veterans Day celebration every year in the capital, but around here you wouldn't even know it was anything but a free day off work. Hey, I always wanted to go to that celebration. It'd be good for Arnold, too. All these kids care about today is a three-day weekend. They ought to be thinking about the meaning of the holiday. You know, the capital's only a day's drive from here. That's right, it is. Hey, Phil, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Arnold Patterson, we're going to the Capitol for the Veterans Day celebration. Huh? You too, Gerald. It's a road trip. We're going to spend the whole weekend together. Just us men. Hit me high, Martin. Phil, you all right? Gotcha. <laughs> well, at least now we know what we're doing this weekend. It might be fun. You know, my dad was in Vietnam. He's probably got some great war stories. I bet he was a big hero. I don't know why we didn't think of this sooner. I'll tell Gerald all about my days in Vietnam. We'll take the Packard and rendezvous at 0600 hours. Private Joe Henson. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. I finally get to tell my story of how I won World War II all by myself. And nobody can run out in the middle of it because we'll be flying down the highway at 90 miles an hour. Grandpa, the speed limit's 55. I know. <laughs> I'll tell all about the time I wrestled Adolf Hitler himself to the ground and kicked his patoot. Grandpa, can I just ask you one favor? I don't have any more milk, Judge Arnold. <sighs> no, not that. Can you just for once tell the truth about what happened to you in the war? Instead of one of your crazy made-up stories? Crazy made-up stories? When have I ever told you any crazy made-up stories? Actually, you do it all the time. Well, okay, maybe I stretched the truth once or twice, but this story is completely true. Every word of it. Okay. You want to drive? Grandpa. Oh, all right, I'll drive. But if I get tired, you take over, okay? You boys are going to love this. We'll get to see all the monuments depicting famous battles, and there'll be a parade and even fireworks. You betcha, Martin. And it's only 18 hours away. 18 hours? Let's hit it. <laughs> you didn't see nothing. I want to hear about you, Dad. Were you a war hero? Well, the way I look at it, son, most everybody who goes to war is a hero in some way. But you were in Vietnam, right? In battle? Well, I was in Vietnam, serving my country. Did you have a gun? Did you ever shoot anybody? Well, the Army did issue me a rifle. But being a veteran is not about carrying a weapon or fighting in battles. It's about service to your country. And there are a lot of ways you can serve. Hey, wait a minute. What about my story? Sorry, Phil. Would you like to go first? Well, my story did happen before yours. Plus, I'm an old man. Who knows how much time I've got left? I've got a feeling you got plenty of time left. 
but you go right ahead. There I was on the battlefields of Northern Europe over 50 years ago in January 1945. I was a young GI with a strong back and a head full of brilliant dreams. Yes, Hedy. Oh, yes, of course I'll marry you. Oh, yes, uh, right after I become a big war hero. Then we'll get married and I'll be Mr. Hedy Lamar. Those potatoes ain't gonna peel themselves, Private! Uh, 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 yes, sir. Uh, peeling, sir. Uh, I wasn't sleeping. No, sir. Just thinking about kicking Hitler's butt, yes, sir. I was an assistant cook in the First Army. All day long I peeled potatoes and washed pots and pans. But I knew one day I'd get out of the kitchen and get my chance on an important mission. And then I'd become a real hero. Hey, Phil! I'm busy. Colonel wants to see you. The Colonel! <laughs> oh boy, it's my big mission! <laughs> medic! Even though I was woozy from my fall and loopy from the pills the medic gave me, I could still understand nearly half the instructions the Colonel gave me. This was it, my big mission. Seems I was handpicked to deliver a truckload of bad jam to an a undisclosed of what? jam. Bad jam. Jam? What's jam? Is that like spam? No, it's completely different. Spam is a delicious, nutritious, hand-based product enjoyed by millions of people all over the world for more than 50 years. Jam, on the other hand, is a combination of chicken and ham byproducts randomly packed in leaky tin containers and briefly introduced to the military for experimental purposes in December of 1944. <laughs> the point is, this jam turned out to be bad meat. And I mean really bad meat. Gave you the runs like there was no tomorrow. So my job was to drive this truckload of bad jam to a dumping ground somewhere in northern France. Of course, the exact location was a closely guarded military secret. The night was dark and thick with fog as I started on my important and dangerous journey. I could barely see my nose in front of my face. But I was determined to fulfill my mission. Inch by inch, I drove on, braving the elements. The hours passed. By dawn, the fog had cleared, and I decided to pull over and make camp. Sucking up the fear that churned in my gut, I wondered, where was I? How close was the enemy? Would I ever see my beloved regiment again? Hey, fool! Yeah! You up for poker? Again, I'm on a secret mission! Oh, yeah! You're dumping the bad jam, right? Right! Hey, wait a minute. How did you know? The whole camp knows! Well, don't tell anybody else, okay? It was at that moment I realized my situation had become even more perilous. If the whole regiment knew I was on a secret mission to deliver bad meat, there was no telling who else knew, maybe even the enemy. On top of that, I was only 200 yards from camp with a long way to go. And on top of that, my weenie was on fire. <laughs> Help, my weenie's on fire, medic. I had to make up time and do it fast. So I put the pedal to the metal, knowing my mission was more important than any traffic laws or hazard signs. Late that night, I got pretty tired and hungry, not to mention lonesome. So I stopped at a little French farmhouse to rest. But the farmer had gone off to join the French army, and there was no one left at home except his three beautiful daughters. There was no room in the farmhouse, but they agreed to let me spend the night in the barn. Just when I was about to nod off, there came a knock on the barn door. It was the oldest daughter, Monique. She was bathed in moonlight, wearing a figure-flattering diaphanous peasant dress. Oh, Monsieur Field, she said. The war, she has made me so scared and lonely. Uh, uh, maybe you should skip on down to the next part of the story. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah maybe you're right. I'll tell you that part later. Anyway, I woke up the next morning feeling like a million bucks and ready to get back on my secret mission. I don't know how many miles I drove, how many turns I took on all those zigzagging back roads, but I was determined to accomplish my big mission. Then it happened. I don't know how long it took me to change the tire, but I worked as fast as I could. And all the time I knew that there was a possibility the Nazis weren't more than a few miles away. Little did I know! American is a Schweinhund! I turned and saw the most horrible sight anyone could ever see. There, standing over me, with eyes glowing like fiery coals, was the Fuhrer himself, Adolf Hitler! Take that, Hitler! Let me beat you! 
Red, White und Blau. Nein, Peter, Onkel, Onkel. Grandpa, you did not fight Adolf Hitler. You're making this all up. <laughs> okay, you got me. I made that part up. Pretty funny, huh? <laughs> it was Goebbels. All right, so it wasn't Hitler himself, but it was a whole brigade of Nazi soldiers. I stumbled into the midst of the biggest, most ferocious German panzer brigade in the whole war. What happened? Did they take you prisoner? Did they torture you? I'll tell you the whole terrifying story, but first we gotta stop for gas. But Phil, we got half a tank. I know we got half a tank in the car, but I've got a full tank in here. And if I don't get some relief, we're not gonna make it. Oh, 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 ah. oh you relief. Wait, wait a minute, this isn't the main room. Ah! I'm sorry, lady, it was an honest mistake. <laughs> You were captured by the Nazis, miles behind enemy lines, all by yourself? All by my lonesome, surrounded by ferocious Nazi soldiers. They were lean, they were mean, but most of all, they were hungry. They just ran out of rations, and when they opened the back of my truck, they got pretty excited. And I realized they were planning to eat it. I yelled out, No, don't eat it, that's bad meat! What did you say? I said that. <laughs> <laughs> that tickles. I said that's bad meat. Don't eat it. Is it really bad meat, or is that what you want us to think? That's what I want you to think, because it is. It's bad meat. It's very bad. <laughs> mm. Since you are the enemy, if the meat was bad, you would want me to eat it. So therefore, logically, you would tell me the meat was good. Isn't that right, American? Right, sure. It makes sense to me. But you knew that I would think that, didn't you? Oh, yes, I... I sure did. You, you got me there. You're smart. Oh, it's no wonder they made you captain. Major. Major, yes. Oh, that's much better than captain. Much better. Because uh, you, you're, you're a major. You, you, you could boss captains around. You could say, hey, captain, go get me a newspaper. Hey, clean my boots, captain. Silence! You think you're smarter than me, don't you? Oh, no, sir. No, I don't. I... Yeah. American. You think if you tell me the meat is bad, then I will think you are telling me the meat is bad because it is really good. But I know you are telling me the meat is bad because you know I will think you are telling me the meat is bad because you think I will think you are telling me the meat is bad because it is really good. Isn't that right, American? The meat is bad thinks it's good. Oh, this is hard. When, in fact, the meat is really good after all. Isn't that right? That's when it hit me. I realized if I let him think he was smarter than me, I could make him do anything I wanted. Oh, you're right. It's true. The meat is good. Why did I think I could ever outsmart a captain? Major! Major, right. You Nazis are so much smarter than us. We can't win the war. I'm such a dumb, stupid idiot. That meat was supposed to be for General Montgomery, and now you guys are going to eat it, and I'm going to be in big, big trouble. You won't tell him, will you? <laughs> no thanks, I'm not hungry. <laughs> well, the next morning, they were all sick as dogs. That's right, I captured the entire Panzer Division. Just me. No, this is not a joke. American, please help me. I have a bad ache in my tummy. Hold on a sec. Oh, you got a tummy ache? Ugh. Well, maybe this will help. Now, look here. You tell the general to get a couple of divisions down here on the double. I busted a hole in the enemy line six miles wide. If you hurry, you can walk straight through to Berlin. That night, the Allies rolled right through the gap I created in the German lines. They marched down to Berlin and won the war. Because of me, America achieved victory and total domination over the Germans. Ah, oh, stupid Mercedes! That's amazing! So you just about won the whole war all by yourself? <laughs> well, practically. Of course, the other guys helped, you know, uh, General Patton and some of the Canadians. That's uh, quite a story, Phil. Did you ever capture a brigade of enemy soldiers? No, son, I didn't. But you saw a lot of action, right? Oh, sure, I saw plenty of action. Did you ever shoot anybody? To tell you the truth, I did. I was only 19 when I was drafted. It was toward the end of the war, and a lot of young men didn't believe in the cause. 
Some of them ducked out and went to Canada on principle. I thought about that too. I thought about it a long time. Mostly because I wasn't too sure myself about what we were doing in Vietnam. And partly because I was scared like everybody else who went. But in the end, I decided my country asked me to go, and right or wrong, I had to oblige. I had had two weeks of basic training, but I'd missed most of it because I was out with the flu. They sent me on with my regiment anyway. Next thing I know, I'm at rifle practice. And that's when it happened. None of us saw it coming, least of all me. You got 45 seconds, Private! Let me see you clean that rifle! Yes, sir! Christopher Columbus and a crack wheat cracker! Who discharged that weapon? I shot my own colonel. Now, this isn't the first time I've been shot in the butt. That's right, Private. It's happened before. But last time I was shot in the butt, it was at the hands of the enemy, not one of my own recruits! Now, what do you have to say for yourself, soldier? I was sick with the flu during most of basic training, sir. Sick with the flu? He was sick with the flu! What are you good at, Private? What can you do without screwing it up? I was assigned to the main office of the Army Medical Records Department as a file clerk. Wait a minute. You were a file clerk? That's right. But I thought you said you saw plenty of action when you were in the war. That's right, I did. And it happened when I least expected it. First thing the next morning with no warning at all. 227 files were dropped on my desk. And my job was to get them all checked, organized, and filed away by 1,700 hours. Not one of those files was in order. You've never seen such a mess. But that was just at the beginning, right? I mean, after that, you got into some battles, didn't you? Well, no, Gerald. Actually, I spent my whole tour in that office, filing and stamping and keeping things organized. But you mean you never saw any battles? Not really. I was too busy with my duties. Oh. There was one time I had to go north to deliver some records up near Anlock. I passed by where a battle had occurred some time before. There really wasn't anybody around except this one kid who'd been separated from his regiment. I believe his name was Miller. He had a wound of some kind. I couldn't tell how serious it was, but there wasn't anybody else around, so I thought I'd better do what I could. I didn't have any bandages, but of course I had my primary files with me. I took out some papers, applied some disinfectant, and made a bandage out. Sure impressed him with our war stories, eh, Martin? I hope so. I really want Gerald to understand what it means to serve your country. And it's not about being a big hero, but doing your best. Uh-huh. Man, my dad didn't do anything in the war. Sure he did. Oh, yeah? What? Well, he helped file and organize all those papers. Uh, big deal. He helped that soldier with his wound. Arnold, he wrapped a couple of file papers around some soldier's leg. I mean, anybody could have done that. The guy wasn't even hurt that bad anyway. The fact is, my dad was just a file clerk. He didn't even learn how to shoot a gun. He didn't win any battles or save anybody. I don't see how it made any difference that he even went to Vietnam. I thought he was a hero, but he wasn't. Your dad's still a really good guy. I know. At least he told you the truth about what happened. He didn't make it all up like Grandpa did. for the monument. Yeah, it's around here somewhere. Eureka! Oh, no, that's not it. Oh, oh, bingo! Grandpa, that's you. Of course it is. It's my monument. It's, it's just like in your story. In honor of Private Steely Phil, he single-handedly won the Battle of the Bulge. I can't believe it. You thought I was a big fat liar, didn't you? Huh? Thought I was telling you some crazy made-up story. But here I am in bronze. Private Steely Phillips says, big hero. I don't see a sculpture of you anywhere, you. <laughs> Gerald? Yeah, Dad? I wanted to tell you something. I know how much you wanted to believe I was some kind of big war hero. But the truth is, I wasn't. I didn't carry a gun, and I didn't fight in combat or anything like that. I just tried to give my best when my country asked me to. It's okay, Dad. I know you did your best. You don't have to be a hero. I'm proud of you. Johansson? Private Johansson? Yeah. I knew it was you. It's Miller. Private Miller. 
Private Miller? You remember? Outside of Van Lock, back in 72. I remember. I was sitting in that rice paddy for hours. My platoon had moved on. I kept calling out for a medic, for anybody, but, but nobody came. I didn't know how bad I was hurt. I just knew I couldn't move. After a while, when nobody came, I figured that was going to be it. But then you showed up, out of the blue, Private Martin Johansson. You had all those file folders with you. I wondered what anybody was doing out in the middle of a battlefield with a bunch of file folders. You kept looking at my leg and shaking your head. Then you took out some of those papers and poured something on them out of a bottle. Then you pressed them to my leg and taped it up around me like a bandage. I must have passed out because next thing I knew I was in a hospital in Saigon. The doctors couldn't figure out what I was doing there. They figured I should have bled to death. I tried to tell them that I guess I was still pretty weak. I kept trying to tell them it was Private Johansson. Private Johansson. I waited over 20 years to thank you. I just did what I could. Is uh, this your son? Yes, my son Gerald. Pleased to meet you, Gerald. Hello. Did you know your father's a real hero? This is my wife Sharon and my kids Bobby and Ellen. This is the man I told you about, Martin Johansson, the man who saved my life. It's an honor, sir. 